Any questions, we'll get through as many as we can, but you selected the order. Can you tell us how you selected the order in this? Yeah, sure. Uh, they're not in, in order of importance per se, but more in categories. Uh, but there's two or three questions that dealt with the Bible and its veracity. And so we're going to start there because the Bible is the foundation for everything else. So that's where we'll begin with some Bible questions. Okay, and so the first question we've got up here is, it says which book of the Bible is correct. I think it means which Bible is correct. There are not, there are not only different Bibles, but some have additional books. How were the books selected and the Bible selected, and, and are they both correct? Well, the... <clears throat> There are many different versions of the Bible. I'd like to address that first because a lot of folks, when you say which Bible is correct, they're going to immediately default to which version. King James, New American Standard, New English Version, NIV, so on and so forth. All of those are great. Uh, they're just fine. Uh, the translators uh, translated them a little differently, uh, but they are all very accurate. And people often ask me, well, which version should I buy? And my response is, buy the one you will read. Go, f go find one that reads well for you and buy that version. And there are basically two schools of thought in translation. Uh, one is called a formal translation, the other is called a dynamic translation. And just to give you a couple of examples, the New American Standard is a formal translation, the New International Version is a dynamic translation. And what that simply means is, in a formal translation, the goal of the translators is to translate word for word as close to the original meaning as possible. In a dynamic translation, the translator's goal is to translate the ideas or the, the train of thought. So, it, so what happens is when you translate from one language to another, uh, the New American Standard being a formal translation sometimes is a little static in the way it reads. It's a little tough uh, because it, it adheres to the Greek whether it flows or not. The New International reads a little easier for most people because that's their goal was to make it read. They're both fine. Any of those versions are fine. The other part of the question here is, I, I think one of the things they're getting at is, what about, for instance, the Catholic Bible that has what we call the Apocrypha in it, which is a selection of books that didn't make it into what we call the canon of Scripture, and that's, that's spelled with a single N. And, and when we talk about the canon of Scripture, uh, a canon is uh, the rule or the guide. So that's what we call Scripture. It's our rule and our guide. And the reason the books for, that we find in the Apocrypha didn't make it in is because at the Council of Carthage in 397 AD, when we consider the final uh, formulation of the Bible we have today, they did not think that those books met the criteria to be included in these, to be included in the canon of Scripture. And that's why they're not there. Then the Catholic Church later added them in uh, to their version. And you may say, well, what criteria did they have to meet? And they were really very stringent. When, when we talk about these church councils, like the Council of Carthage, which was one of the, the most important ones, uh, sometimes we think about, well, what was this, a, 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 a group where a group of people got together for a day or a weekend seminar or something, because that's the way we do it today. Uh, no, this was where the best scholars from far and wide, from the far reaches of, of the known world, would come together and sometimes spend two to three years debating these things and deciding which books were included. And they had to meet certain criteria such as, did they have an apostolic signature? In other words, were they written by one of the apostles themselves? Or, as another question we'll bring up later on, did they have apostolic authority? Was the writer given the authority directly from the apostles? They had to have some internal evidence that they pointed to the Lord, that they, they were gospelish, if you will. And uh, they, they also uh, had to be authentic. And so there was a, a great process they had for that. And in fact, today, sometimes, I think we've got a slide 
up here somewhere. Uh, sometimes people ask, well, how do we know the Bible is correct? Uh, we don't have the original autographs, and that's true, we don't. But it's interesting to me that people will ask that, and yet we all assume that the history book we read about Napoleon is correct. Uh, we assume uh, what we read about Caesar is correct. Uh, we assume uh, that Homer's Iliad is correct. Now, why is that? I, I don't, I think it's a spiritual thing, because here's, here's the deal. When you are authenticating an ancient text, you have rules that you go by. And just like we have rules for every uh, scientific endeavor we undertake. And the two biggest things you have when you want to authenticate uh, an ancient manuscript is, how many copies do we have? And you can, you can understand that because let's just take one out of the air, the book of Jeremiah. If we only had one copy of that, how would we know if that copy was correct or not? Well, we don't. But now if we have a hundred copies and they all line up with one another, then we can say, okay, this must be a correct manuscript. The other major factor is how close is the manuscript we have to the original writing. The closer it is to the original, the more weight it has. So your two big factors is our number of copies and proximity to the original writing. Now the most highly attested ancient text we have outside of the Bible is Homer's Iliad. That's why it's up there as one of our examples. And if you look at the Iliad, it was written in 700 BC. The date of the earliest manuscript we don't even know. And we have 643 copies of it. Okay. The history of Herodotus was written in 425 BC. The earliest copy is AD 900, and we only have eight. Josephus, written in AD 70, 8400 earliest copy, and we only have nine. And yet, all historians pretty much assume Josephus is accurate. The history of Tacitus, AD 100, 800 years later is our earliest copy, and we have two. Now I want you to look at the New Testament, and it's in a whole different league. Written between 35 and 100 A.D., the earliest copy is only 25 years after the fact. And we have 5,735 copies of that. That's quite a difference. So we can say for certain that our canon here is accurate. And uh, that leaves out the fact that if you believe God superintended the the giving of this book, I think we have to believe that he superintended the compiling of it into what we have today. So this is absolutely accurate. That's a great answer. Um, you mentioned the apostles, and, and we're gonna, I'd like to, the next question deals with the, the four of the apostles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, we know that Matthew and John were uh, one of Jesus, uh, tw uh, the 12, uh, one of the chosen 12 of Jesus. And they had first-hand knowledge of what they wrote about. But both Mark and Luke were companions of Paul. So the question here is, how did Mark and Luke get the information to write their books? Was it second-hand information? Isn't that hearsay? And if it was second-hand information, how many people provided them information? And did they write these books or did somebody else write them for them? Yeah, that's a great, great question. And the answer is, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> they, they got their information both secondhand and from personal observance. If you, if you read scripture carefully, and you have, yeah, I admit you have to kind of look around for these things, but if you look in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, Peter refers to Mark as my beloved son. They were inseparable companions. Mark was with Peter pretty much all of the time. And when Mark writes, he's, getting, he's writing what Peter told him to write and what he observed from observing Peter. Uh, plus, if we look in Mark 14, 51, we find there the story of uh, the young man that had the linen cloak that when they came to arrest Jesus ran off. You remember the story? And he left his linen cloak there. And uh, his name is John Mark. 
Okay? Now, the linen cloak is uh, important because it tells us a little something about him. It tells us that he was a wealthy individual uh, because poor people couldn't afford linen in those days. So here we have this wealthy young man who is with Jesus. Okay, though he's not official apostle. And then he goes on to spend the rest of his time uh, with Peter. And in, in Acts 12.12, 12, it refers to him as John Mark. So there we find him uh, with Paul. So this guy's hanging around with Paul, Peter, Jesus. So that's where Mark got his information from. And by the way, Mark was considered uh, the first gospel written. And then the others came out. Uh, as for Luke... Uh, Luke, again, was a almost constant companion of some of the apostles, and especially Paul. Uh, as, as Mark was to Peter, Luke was to Paul. Uh, Luke traveled extensively with Paul, and so on and so forth. And in, in Luke, uh, they don't keep this thing any kind of a secret. In Luke chapter 1, verse 2, it uh, simply says uh, this. Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. You see? So he's not claiming to be an eyewitness. He's telling you right up front that he was getting information uh, from the apostles. But then we find out in Acts, uh, when, when we, we get to chapter 16, you, theologians divide Acts at chapter 15, which is the Council of Jerusalem. That's one way to divide it. But the other way to divide it is between what they refer to as the they and we passages. Luke is the author of Acts. We, we all know that. And if you read the first 15 chapters, you will find that the, the author always says things like, they went, they did this, they did that, Paul did this, so-and-so did that. But all of a sudden in chapter 16, it changes to the we passages. And it says, we went here, we went there, we did this, we did that. And you see what's, what's happened is uh, Mark has now left, and Luke is now Paul's traveling companion. So again, first-hand knowledge, but authorization from the apostles. That's a great, another great answer. Um, you know, you, you mentioned that the, the Bible is the Word of God. How can we effectively communicate to non-believers that God is the author of His Word and not man? Short answer? You can't. Well, that's disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. You cannot effectively communicate to non-believers that God is the author of his word. If by that you mean, can I convince them the Bible is true? The answer is no, you cannot. Because, now that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have evidence to show them why we believe what we believe and so on and so forth. But 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verse 14 you know, Paul is very clear. The natural man does not understand the things of God. He cannot because they are spiritually discerned, you see. So you can present all the evidence you want, but unless the Holy Spirit enlightens them, unless the Holy Spirit makes it real to them, they're not going to get it. You see, uh, think back to Matthew chapter 16, and you remember well, where uh, Jesus and Peter were having a little discourse, and Jesus asked Peter, he says, who do people say that I am? Or he asked the apostles in general, who do people say that I am? And he gets various answers. And he looks at Peter and he says, Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Peter Barjona, for... You did not figure this out for yourself, but God revealed it to you. And that's what happens. In the process of our witnessing to people, God chooses to enlighten some, and they say, oh, I get it. And others never get it. So it's, it's still incumbent upon us to share the good news, to share what we know, to share the scriptures, but don't be consumed with having to convince people uh, because that's the Holy Spirit's job. It's our job to present the evidence. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convince people that it's true. That's very, uh, very uh, good to hear. I'm glad that, uh, that we have that. Now, we're going to change the, the subject just a little bit. Um, because it has to do with our ability to make our own decisions. 
How many of our decisions does God allow us to make on our own without His interference? Since God's omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, then He is absolutely sovereign, and it is possible that He allows us to make some of our own decisions and holds us accountable for the consequences. It's a great question. So, when we talk about the will of God, we have to have another layer of specificity than we usually use. Uh, because the will of God, we, we have to nail down what is it exactly we're talking about. And there should be a slide somewhere. There we go. When we talk about the will of God, and, and I should say up front, uh, Scholars disagree on this. Believe it or not, I know you're, you're going to be shocked, but there are people that disagree with me on this. I, I can't imagine <laughs> such a thing, but, but there are. So uh, here's the authoritative answer. When we talk about the will of God, we have to break it into at least three categories. There's the permissive will of God, the declarative will of God, and the sovereign will of God. And... Uh, they, they become increasingly more incumbent upon God. The permissive will of God is uh, more the everyday mundane things. I don't believe uh, that... Uh, I didn't bother to pray for the Seahawks this morning. Okay, Not because I didn't think they needed it. <laughs> but I'm going to pray for the Seahawks. There's going to be other folks out there praying for the Panthers. Now, does God really favor one over the other because I happened to ask him for the Seahawks to win? Mm. No. If it worked that way, I'd be a better golfer. <laughs> <laughs> I think in a everyday life, God allows us to make a lot of decisions for ourselves. Uh, we, we sometimes get things a little out of sync. Uh, for instance, while we're talking about football, uh, we see a, a football player make a touchdown. And... Uh, you know, he thanks God that he was able to make a touchdown. Well, a little a more accurate response would be that he thanked God for giving him the ability to make the touchdown. You see, uh, I don't think God intervened and moved the men out of his way so he could make the touchdown. Now, God could do that. I'm not saying he couldn't, but I don't think he does. So in the realm of his permissive will, he allows us to make decisions. And those decisions have consequences, of course. Uh, and so we, we go through life doing that. Now we'll take it up a notch and we'll talk about God's declarative will. Well, what do we mean by his declarative will? Well, we can find a great example in Exodus chapter 20. We all know what chapter 20 is, right? The Ten Commandments. God has declared His will for us. It's His will for us that we honor our father and mother. It's His will for us that we do not murder. It said we can go right down the list. So there are things that God has declared, this is my will for you. But again, He leaves us some discretion in there. He says, here's my will, I've written it down, it's black and white, this is what I want you to do, but I'll still leave you the ability to be disobedient. Uh, like I say, Acts 20 is, is, or Exodus 20 is a good example of that. So those two are pretty easy. So we'll move on now to God's sovereign will, because I think that's the one we really, really struggle with. If God has determined all things, uh, how does that work out uh, in our lives? Well, when it comes to things such as salvation, when it comes to things as the unfolding of history as God wants it to flow, His sovereign will always rules and overrules. The thing is, we don't know when He's overruling our rule. Because when we make a decision that fits with His sovereign will, we think we made the decision. Because we don't feel Him guiding us, He doesn't hit us over the head and say, I want you to go over here. He plants it in our minds to do what he wants us to do. Uh, an example would be Exodus chapter 50 verse 20. And if you remember what's happening there, the story of Joseph is winding up and uh, the, he has revealed himself to his brothers, you know, the brothers that did all the bad stuff to him. And, and they're afraid that he's going to be retributive against them. And he says to them, 
No, don't worry, because what you meant for evil, God meant for good. A perfect example of God's sovereign will. They thought they were doing one thing for one reason. They didn't have the slightest idea that they were setting the stage for Joseph to literally save uh, the, the world at that time. And if you know the rest of the story and the famines and all that, you'll understand. Uh, a New Testament example would be Acts chapter 9. And there we have the conversion of Saul or Paul. Now what's he doing? He's on his way to Damascus to arrest Christians and persecute them. God literally knocks him off his horse and speaks to him. Sovereign will. You're going to do what I want you to do. Uh, another instance uh, might be uh, Acts chapter 16, where Paul is uh, wanting to go into Macedonia, and he has a dream. And in the dream, he's forbidden to go there, so he turns around and goes to Asia. Those are examples of God's sovereign will. Uh, the story uh, by Somerset Maugham uh, that isn't intended to be biblical necessary, but I think most of you have heard me relate that story, where there's this uh, <coughs> uh, wealthy man, and he has a servant, and he really loves his servant, his servant loves him, they get along good, they've been together for years. One morning he sends the servant into town to buy some, some uh, groceries and things, and while the servant's in town, <clears throat> he sees uh, death there. And when he sees death, he bumps into her, and he's startled, he's scared to death, he runns back home, he tells, tells his master, he says, well, I was in the marketplace, uh, Lady Death was there, she threatened me, I have to get out of here, I have to go to Samara. So uh, the, his uh, master, wanting to help him all he could, says, take my best her horse and go to Samara. So he does, and then the master gets to thinking about this, and he gets kind of angry, and he says, I'm going to go down to the town square and see if I can find Lady Death and see just why she's messing with my guy. So he goes down there, and he finds her, and he says to her, he says, why did you make a threatening gesture toward my servants this morning? And she says to him, oh, that wasn't a threatening gesture at all. I was just surprised to see him here because I have an appointment with him in Samara this evening. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of how God's sovereign will works out. Uh, we're not, we don't have to go through life worrying about we're going to thwart God's goal somehow by making a wrong decision. Okay? Just relax, go with it, it'll be fine. Okay, now we're going to switch subjects kind of. Um Sometimes the, the Bible is a bit confusing because it appears that it conflicts with itself. And so the next question is, the Old Testament says Elijah ascended to heaven in uh, 2 Kings 2.11. And it also says that Enoch was bodily taken to heaven in Genesis 5.24. But in John 3.13, it says, no one has ever gone into heaven except Jesus. How do you explain this? Well, we have to do a little detective work, okay. which you should be familiar with. Yeah. So uh, we will do that. The first thing we want to do, look at is the context. Okay. Uh, what has, has just been going on? Jesus has been talking with Nicodemus. And he tells Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus says, how can this be? And Nicodemus is supposed to be a, a learned man who knows things. And Jesus even says, well, you're supposed to know this stuff. How come you don't? What's wrong with you? And, and then he, he goes on with what you're saying. In fact, in uh, John chapter 3, 3, 3, 3. Jesus says to this, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I've told you, told you earthly things, you will not believe. How can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. So that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But he's talking to Nicodemus, and Nicodemus is dealing with the rational thought process. So let me just share what a couple other people have said that are much smarter than me. A guy by the name of Homer Kent who taught at Grace Theological Seminary from 1949 to 1999. That's 50 years. He ended up being president. He's still alive. 
and uh, he's written a commentary on John and uh, it's a very good one it's called light in the darkness here's what he says about that passage he says no mere man has ascended into heaven to bring back an authoritative word from God only Jesus did that and if you remember uh, in the Gospels they were so impressed with Jesus but because he spoke as one with authority not so much what he said but he spoke as one with authority so that's what Homer Kent says John Calvin 1509 to 1564 he's no longer with us <laughs> Only those who trust Christ as their guide will find their way to heaven. That's what he says about this passage. That's what Christ is trying to convey to Nicodemus. And I think that's true. He says Christ is the only one who has both ascended and descended. Now I know you're still you're thinking, well, he asked about Enoch and Elijah. He didn't, so we're going to talk about them. Here we go. Enoch. Now we're, we're, we're going to do a little detective work here okay how is it that Enoch went to heaven well if you read in Genesis it says Enoch was taken up correct right okay what what is Enoch's role in that it's passive is it not Enoch was taken up Enoch did nothing right okay let's go to Elijah it says he went up by a whirlwind what was Elijah's role? He didn't do anything. Passive. Yeah. He didn't do anything either. But when we read what John says here, he says Jesus ascended. What was Jesus' role? Active. He ascended. You see, so uh, Enoch and Elijah missed the death experience. But they didn't ascend to heaven on their own. And probably more importantly after ascending they didn't come back where Jesus did that explains it then okay so now we're there, another question that, that you know has been bothersome at least somebody is does God remember our sins in Jeremiah 31 34 it says that he doesn't but Exodus 34 6 and 7 says he punishes those guilty of sin by punishing the children and the children's children how do you how do you reconcile those two okay uh, I, that's one that a lot of folks wrestle with uh, because he he does say in uh, Jeremiah that he will remember our sins no more Jeremiah 31 34 uh, and uh, he also says that the uh, questioner didn't allude to this but in Psalm 103 verse 12 it says as far as the east is from the west so far have I removed their sins and you know that's a that's a figure of speech saying they're gone as far as they can go there's no bringing them back okay but then he also says the thing about the generational sin and we, we need to remember we're talking about a couple of different things here uh, the generational sin is what we do affects our children and oftentimes it will affect their children and their children. Uh, all of us that uh, have read uh, at least a little bit about how uh, child abusers tend to have been abused. Uh, not to sound too sexist up here, but it's, it's a good example. Uh, women who marry abusive men and divorce them tend to remarry abusive men and tend to have come from abusive homes and and the reason that is is as uncomfortable as it sounds we become comfortable with the environment we were raised in in that we know how to cope we we know how to operate in that environment if I come from a home where I was totally unloved and abused I'm going to be very uncomfortable in a setting where I am totally loved and accepted as crazy as that sounds it, if, if you talk to people probably in your profession yeah. uh, or you talk to psychologists and that 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 is true so I think the generational sin that's what God's talking about there now as far as him remembering our sins does he forget that we did them no because he's, he's omniscient he knows everything when we talk about biblical New Testament forgiveness we're not talking about some sort of theological amnesia what we're talking about is he promises to never bring them up again okay. so he when we stand before God 
all of the sins that we have committed will never be brought up because they've been forgiven in Christ. You see, not forgotten, forgiven. And many of you have heard me say, I think the person that coined the phrase forgive and forget ought to be shot. Yeah, because when you tie those two together, people think, well, I can't forgive because I can't forget. And if I can't do the one, I can't do the other. That's not true. Forgiveness is remembering, but giving up your right to bring it up again. That's why uh, in Ephesians 4.32, and you all know I like to spout this one, uh, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. And then the key phrase there, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. So that's forgiveness. It isn't forgetting. It's not bringing it up the next time you get in an argument or a fight. It's so tempting to bring that up and say, well, remember when? <laughs> Don't do it. If you bring it up, if you remember when, you have not forgiven. So that's the key there. That's terrific. All right. Now we're going to talk about heaven because the question is one in which there's a bit of confusion. Uh, when you die you're supposed to go to heaven. And it sounds like it's immediate. But then, when you take and read in Revelations, it talks about Jesus coming back and the dead being raised out of the oceans and the grace for judgment. So, does he yank us back or, or what? What's happening there? <laughs> well, that's a, that is a good question. Uh, theologically, there's a thing called the intermediate state. And, and that is uh, from the time we die and are buried until the time Christ comes back. Now, according to Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, he says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So what happens is, when we die, our spirit, our soul, immediately is with the Lord. Okay? Our body is laying in the ground, or under the ocean, or burnt up, and we're some ashes and a thing, whatever it is. Okay? That's what it is. But our soul, the thing that it makes us who we are, the thing that's eternal, is with Christ. Now, when he returns, yes, all the bodies will be resurrected. And 1 Corinthians 15 is a great place to read about this. It tells about it. And what will happen then, somehow we will get new bodies and be, you know, we'll have a spiritual uh, existence of some kind. And we will all be judged. But there are two judgments going on. For instance, there are two lines. And uh, one line is for believers and one line is for unbelievers. And the unbelievers will go be before what's called the great white throne for their judgment. And, and that will be simply the judgment of, did you accept me or did you reject me? And that's the end of them. Um, the second line will be for Christians and that will go before the, the Bema seat of judgment and the Bema judgment seat was not a judicial judgment seat but it was the judgment seat that was found at the uh, the games uh, the Olympic Games when, when their beginnings and before there was a judgment seat where the athletes would all come before at the end to d get their rewards and that's the judgment we will we will go before we will be rewarded for the good deeds we've done in the body it won't be a matter of whether we go to heaven or not. Uh, so when we die, we go to heaven, but we're not, it's not done completely, and God didn't bother to give us a lot of details. Well, that's a, <laughs> well it explains it anyway. Um, the, uh, we now are going to move to Judas because the story of Judas seems to conflict. How did he really die? Did he hang himself, as, as Matthew said, or did he fall down in the potter's field as his body burst open and spilled the intestines all over everywhere like it's described in Acts? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, as best as we can tell, and this is one we, we just can't have a whole lot of detail about because we're only talking about two verses, and they seem to give different accounts. Uh, the best explanation I was able to find was that when he hanged himself, he botched it and ended up decapitating himself and being a big mess. And because that's if you if you remember the old western movies, you see how they did the hangman's noose and and all that. I don't know exactly how they made them, but the the number of coils depended on the weight of the body and all this stuff. Because if you didn't do it right, you jerked their head off and that didn't look good. So they think probably something like that happened. We just don't know for sure. And sometimes we just have to leave it at that. 
Okay, uh, this one's a this one's a, a, a really interesting question. Uh, was Jesus capable of or able to tell a lie? No. And it's, this kind of harkens to the question of, could Jesus sin? Could he have sinned? You know, it says in Hebrews uh, chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, that we have a high priest who, in all things like as us, was tempted, but without sin. And the argument kind of goes... If he was not able to sin, could he really have been tempted? Because in order to have a temptation be real, you had to have the ability to succumb to the temptation. Well, the answer lies in uh, the theological term, uh, hypostatic union, which is great to banter about. But what that simply means is that Jesus Christ was fully man and fully God at the same time. Okay. And I don't understand that. I can't explain that to you. I believe that. See, there's some places in the Christian world where you just have to come down to a belief. I can give you a dozen books on it, and when you get through with them, you won't understand it either. Because the guys that wrote the books don't understand it. Sounds like we're, Bonhoeffer. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're just not equipped. Uh, he, he wasn't half man and half God. He, he wasn't some... He was both... 100% at the same time. So was he tempted? Yes. Could he sin? No. So Jesus could not tell a lie because if he's fully God, whatever he spoke is going to be truth. So there you go. Next is going to talk a little bit of a question about Moses. You know, Moses wasn't allowed to enter the promised land due to one act of disobedience after a lifetime of service. And the question is, was God just in doing so? And if so, and of course we're going to assume that he was, and, and you know, should those of us who were disobedient more than once be concerned about our ability to get into heaven? <laughs> well... Uh, the answer is we should probably all be concerned about our ability to get into heaven because we have no ability to get into heaven. That's all God's, God's ability. Uh, but what Moses did, striking the rock wasn't the problem. See, again, we look, at the, we look at the physical and we say, okay, God told him to speak to the rock. He struck the rock. Therefore, God says you don't go into the promised land. His Striking the rock wasn't the problem. The problem was what he took upon himself in striking the rock. Because if, if you read the account in, uh, in Numbers, chapter 20, I believe it is, you will find that Moses is before the people and he says, are you guys so messed up that we are going to have to bring forth water from the rock? And that little two-word letter word is what shot him down. Because who is he associating himself with when he says we? He and God now are partners in this thing. And he's elevating himself to equality with God. That's what got him in trouble. That's what kept him out of the promised land. It wasn't so much the action, it was the motivation and the pride behind the action. But let me read for you in Romans 9. And Romans 9 is, is one of the greatest chapters in the Bible and one of the most misunderstood and, and it's, it's just a great chapter. So here, here's what he says. He says, For this is what the promise said about the time next year I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah has conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue. Not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I, have I loved, Esau have I hated. Here's the thing to know. We don't get into heaven by what we've done, and we don't, aren't kept out of heaven by what we haven't done, or vice versa, okay? Right here it explains it to us. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, before they were ever born, before they had ever done good or bad. So Moses didn't forfeit his trip into the promised land because of what he did. But you say, is that just? And that 
proper question. So here's the answer. Uh, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? And Paul answers, by no means. For he says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. So Moses was kept out of there because he assumed to be equal with God. And I know we find that hard to believe, but that's what he did. And our salvation is not based on what we do or what we don't do. It's based solely on God's grace. In fact, I, I had this little email the other day about Sunday school. And the teacher was asking the kids what she had to do to get into heaven. You know, was it do bad, do good things? No, 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 what it was. And uh, anyway, the kids had better insight on it, I think, than she did. So uh, we're, we're saved by grace, not of ourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's what we need to know. The saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves. It's all God. And that should really comfort us. And we better quit. Uh, because it's late. Thank you for yeah. answering these questions. My understanding is now you're going to answer the rest of them in the newsletter, right? I will. Mm -hmm. So if your question didn't get answered, it, it shall be, but you're going to have to read. So, and I know you always devour every word that I write in that newsletter. So, so we'll get to all the rest of your questions and, uh, over the next couple of months and, and take care of them. I hope that was somewhat helpful. Uh, if not, uh, Mike will be glad to <laughs> explain the rest to you.